Hi, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of an all new podcast series that I'm starting. It is called The Disney Compendium, A Timeline of the Magic. And the goal of it is to chronologically critique and talk about and go into the history behind all of Walt Disney Animation Studios animated films. Now, animation, uh, I am uh, JJ and my friend on the other end of this here, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everybody, I'm Nick and uh, you can't see me. <laughs> my camera's not working. It's okay. This is gonna be audio mostly anyways. You can watch this on YouTube, but uh, it's, it's fine. We, they don't need to see your camera. <laughs> You also can't see me because I might be John Cena. No. Okay, okay, let's. let's yeah. I, I should have warned out of the gate that that might happen, but <laughs> here, here we are. Um, so, Nick, the, the inspiration I had behind this podcast is uh, recently there's been a lot more podcasts springing up. Um, most recently, I've been listening to a podcast called Unspooled, mm -hmm. and it is uh, with Paul Shear. Um, and it is, they're going through the AFI top 100 movie list. Oh, cool. And it's, it's really fun to like, sort of just be hyper-focused about a specific subject. And in this case, it's the 100, uh, American movies as voted by the AFI. And uh, I'm also inspired by the fact that I absolutely love everything Disney. Mm -hmm. um, as long it, as I've known you, yeah. Yes, <laughs> and it's never going to change. And there's a lot of um, resources out there for Disney stuff, obviously. Um, some, some more legal than others. <laughs> but, you know, um, a lot of it is sort of either very broad, like it will be documentaries about, as I was talking to you about earlier, like Waking Sleeping Beauty, which is a documentary that follows um, a particular part of time for Disney, which was the 80s and 90s when they're trying to pick themselves up out of the dirt. Mm -hmm. And, or, you know, or it's like just incredibly broad strokes of like, you know, a thousand page Walt Disney biography or, um, you know, so it's it's hard if you want, information about a particular like subject you wikipedia almost has to be your default because there's just kind of like there you you can watch the special features of a uh, snow white dvd or pinocchio dvd or whatever you can read the wikipedia page but there's like they're they're you know they're they're either broad or you have to own the video. There's no books dedicated to just like the history of one particular movie. It's about, you know, an era of time or, you know, uh, all of them at once in some sort of massive collection, you know, like, you know, Disney has had like the art of life and things like that, like, you know, multiple books and stuff themselves have put out. Um, there, there, there's no extensive documentary on the adventures of Spin and Marty that I know of. Yeah, exactly. So Which I would watch, by the way, I would watch. Yeah, that. yeah. So, um, so you know, this is focused. I'm calling this season one because I'm not entirely sure, like you know, where where it'll go after this. But it is strictly focused on just the animation studio films. Um, right. So that doesn't include things like. Um, sequels because those were typically for the most part there's there are a few sequels in the um, hi history of the Walt Disney animation pictures um, so if you tune but, in to hear like us talk about the devil and Max Devlin it yeah happen. yeah you know we're not gonna be doing you know if we talk about like Aladdin 2 or 3 at all return of Jafar or anything it will be in the Aladdin episode or you know they were like you know Pocahontas 2 or Cinderella 3 or whatever, you know, these, the, the, if they get talked about at all, they'll be talked about in the episode directly that because they're not part of the main studio. And, um, and, and with few exceptions, probably not worth having a whole episode dedicated. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, in some instances, it's worth talking about in the sense of maybe what was going on in that uh, part of particular time in Disney history for the franchise or what they were doing. But for the most part, it, it you know, it starts with 
uh, Snow White, and there are, as of recording of this episode, 56 movies that they've put out with Wreck-It Ralph 2 on the way, making it 57. 57, yeah. So, oh, so if we do one a week, um, just a little over a year. Yeah. Uh, we, we might pad it out if we have to, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I don't think we'll. I don't think we'll have a lack of. There, there will be some because there are some. Most movies have an interesting story behind them and how they came to be and how they. Uh, some of them have far not much of a story to tell. It would probably be more of a review. So you know, maybe you know. <laughs> yeah. So maybe fill in a little bit there, but. If we're going to start chronologically, you have to start at the beginning, and that is where we're starting now with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The, the OG. Uh, yes, the very, very first. First, a lot of firsts for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. A couple, uh, there, there was one when doing my research and learning about stuff. I didn't know that we'll get to later. It's the first of something I didn't expect, but we'll get to that when we get to that, uh, okay. but uh, it is it is the first full length cell animated, um, you know, feature length uh, film, like period, like it didn't happen before. Walt wanted uh, to, had, had something to prove. So. And, um, and it was a gamble. It was a gamble. Oh, yeah. So um, they announced it in 1934. Uh, the New York Times interview, they announced that we're working on a Snow White and the Seven Dwarves adaption. And um, they were, the, the goal was to have it done by, uh, by the holidays of uh, 37, to have the world premiere. And well, we'll see, how they, we'll see how close they get to that when they get it. Um, um, this, this movie also has a, kind of a significant, for me as a, as a first, because um, it was when it was re-released in 1983. My grandmother took me to see it. Yeah, it apparently scared the hell out of me. It's uh, <laughs> you know, I just watched it. Uh, I watched it a couple days ago, and I watched it again today because it's not a particularly long movie. It's an hour and a half. No, uh, it's not. Yeah, um, I, it's been a, it, 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 before. It's been a f several years since I've seen it. Uh, since that, since I just recently watched it, uh, there when are. Did get, when did it, what sorry, that? when did it get that? Uh, when was it re uh, released on Blu-ray? Was it? There, is, have there been a couple or just the one? There's been a God, there's been a couple of Blu-ray releases. It just recently had one. Um, it was not last year. It was the year before where they were starting to right. re-release things to get the digital copies with them. But yeah, okay. It was one of their. It was one of their earlier Blu-ray releases. Um, right. Uh, and it was one. Of, it was like their first big, fully featured DVD release back in that time frame. Yeah. Um, that, which is the one I believe I have. Yeah, and and d that's when Disney sort of realized that they could make a lot of money and started, you know, double disking everything and just pumping them full of documentaries and deleted scenes. Like this has deleted scenes. Like it's 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 crazy to think of a cartoon, especially something where everything has to be sort of meticulous you know, put together and on such a, you know, time constraints and everything. Like they have like deleted scenes and deleted scenes saved from a cartoon from 1937 is kind of crazy. <laughs> um, it, it, well, it, in a way it makes sense because you think about like what would have been acceptable standards back then as yeah. far as like, what can we get away with in the 1930s? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one th one an interesting story about um, Walt Disney with this movie was he constantly acted it out in its entirety, like when, like any time he could get anyone to sit down for you know hour and a half or whatever he would right. act out the entire sort of the plot of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs like that's how he told that's how he announced it to the studio. Like they had a meeting and he acted out Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and was like, that's our, that's our, we're making that. That's our next thing. We're making a movie and it's this. Um, that kind of makes sense in a way because don't they to this day, like I know I saw the special features in Coco, which we're not going to get to forever, but 
you know, they still bring animals in the studio to watch them act out things, and yeah. then they, they kind of draw it. So that's yeah. kind of the yeah. genesis of that. Yeah, they've been doing that since virtually day one, and that's just yeah. like uh, you would. Uh, they actually rotoscoped a lot of this movie, not a lot. But, yeah, well, some of this movie. Um, it's it's more obvious in the Snow White scenes, you know, like you, which, they, yeah. So it was the the queen was um, mostly drawn, um, but the prince and Snow White they they did use rotoscoping a few times. Pinto Kovig, who was um, behind uh, Betty Boop animation back in the day, makes sense. Was, was on this, and he was like absolutely against it so and, you know he was you know they brought him in because you know he knew how to animate females and if you think about this movie uh, disney hadn't really done humans that much if at all <laughs> like, no like if you think if, if, uh, they, they were kind of like this those like those blobby looking characters in the old uh, shorts yeah, or you had things like you know you had you had your round disney characters of donald and mickey and minnie and goofy and pluto and all that stuff and you then you had you know they're more abstract stuff because they did have um the silly symphonies and stuff right yeah now was this the only one that had the release under the rko label or no 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 uh disney was working with rko for quite a while even at this point um disney a thing you have to remember when making this movie is disney the studio kind of never had money <laughs> um, they didn't have money in the 30s? Gee, why not? I mean, they, they, they were, yeah. Um, the studio was always broke. Uh, you know, everything that they made went back into the studio. Um, so even the, the, fa the way of getting, like, they had to work with RKO because they have to make these promises to a lender, and that's how you get your money. It's like, okay, we'll make you this amount of silly symphonies, and you're going to be the distributor, and this is how we get our money because they're just there was the, all of the money that they would get went right back into the studio, and it was just very hand to mouth, just through all, virtually the existence of the studio. Like Walt was, despite being rich, like. <laughs> the, the studio and them were never really, you know, never really were just loaded with cash. It was always just like, how are we going to finance this movie now? How are we going to finance this movie now? And the 50s is about when they really turned things around post-World War II. Um, this movie was a success. Yeah. Oh, was it? <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. It may come as, so <laughs> when w the initial, okay, so here's here's something that's, insane to think about okay um walt when he first pitched the movie the the initial estimate for a production was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in 1937 in, in 1934 is when they would have started production okay so and that is just about 10 times more than what it cost for like an average like silly symphony cartoon or you know a one of the, one of their one of their longer form short cartoons like it's cheaper to make a Mickey Mouse but like a silly symphony um, needed more work done into it so it, it was about it was about twenty five thousand dollars for a silly symphony um, I, I nobody was, nobody was willing to really give them that money obviously like and that wasn't even close to the budget of like regular live action full length features at the time because even you know you had stuff like well, this is the era of not quite Citizen Kane, but like you know, those big war epics in the 30s. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, Walt's trying to drum up the money to get this movie on because he firmly believes in it. He believes that cartoons can be, you know, just as prestigious as, uh, as, as, you know, live action films. Like, but there's no, there's like nobody's going to take a short film seriously because it is the, you know, it is the bumper before getting your movie so you know it's always the thing that plays before a movie and there's also no money in it like you know nobody's the ticket sales are mostly going to go towards the movie and not towards your cartoon even if people are going to see your cartoon maybe in a maybe in a batch maybe kids are going in the afternoon or stuff but there's still just like no real money it's in. just there yeah yeah i mean and so 
you know, he, he had something to prove and also needed money. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's the first full length feature film cell feature film cartoon. Like even his brother who was uh, Roy, who was, you know, the finance guy and sort of his co-owner of the studio was trying to talk him out of it. His wife is trying to talk him out of it. Virtually everyone is trying to talk Walt out of making this movie. Newspapers were already dubbing it Walt's Folly. Uh, <laughs> it, it was just, it, it, yeah, it was like everyone just thought that this was the worst idea possible. And he, they mortgaged their house. Like Walt mortgaged the house to help finance the movie. And it's just a sneak into the rest, wrestling reference in there. It's kind of similar to what we know about the first WrestleMania, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if, 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 if yeah, if you know anything about us, it's easy to link something to professional wrestling. And it really is like uh, it, Walt staked his career on this being a success. Here's a question for you. Sure. When all was said and done, the final production cost of this movie what would you guess you, you projected it 250,000 250,000 um i'm going to say it came in uh closer to 500,000 just short of 1.5 million dollars holy Toledo. <laughs> It's an astounding amount of money. That's like for nineteen like, for, for like, thirty-seven. Like it, at at the time, by that point, the the uh, the film that cost close to that amount was what the Ten Commandments. Yeah, yeah. The original Ten Commandments. Yeah. So you know, this 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 movie had to succeed. It cost the studio. It cost the studio and lenders and banks almost, you know, almost uh, a million and a half dollars. Like, how do you, how do you save a picture like that? That what's so over, but this is like Apocalypse Now stuff where it's just like, it just keeps going so over budget that <laughs> the movie has to be such a success. Dopey had a, Dopey had a heart attack halfway through filming. Yeah. And... <laughs> Uh, yeah, Grumpy just just did his own thing, shaved his head, didn't let anyone know he did it. It was just, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, it, it, it ended up being what the highest grossing film of 1937. It was, uh, if it was pretty much, I mean, it wasn't. It, it's it ended up being. I think if you if you take into account I, I, inflation, it is one. I actually it, have the tenth the highest grossing movie of all time, if you take into account inflation. Sold over 109 million tickets. I actually have the list of the top grossing films from that year. Okay. And it's Snow White's number one. And you'll, you'll hear some movies, you're like, I, you'll, you'll maybe hear one or two movies that you actually know. I'll, I'll give you the, the top 16 or so. <laughs> Snow White, Maytime, never heard of it. The Good <laughs> Earth, I've heard of that one. Yeah. One hundred men and a girl. Well, good okay. <laughs> the Firefly. Okay. Topper. I've heard of that. Heard of that one. Yeah. We Willie Willie. Stella Dallas in Old Chicago. The Prince of the Popper. Saratoga. Yeah. The Life of em Emil Zola. Lost Horizon. Dead End. The Hurricane and Heidi. Heidi is probably the most prominent one on that list besides <laughs> Starlight. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the movie was. And an absolute, absolute success. Um, um, it made, it was, what, I think it was $8 million in its initial run. And that's, that's, just, that, that is, that's for, keep in mind, we're not talking about, there's no VHS tapes to release. No, no, no. not a ton of merch uh, out. You know, time movies, time. movies were in theaters a little longer then because, you know, there was no aftermarket for a movie, but it's, Still, it's an astounding eight million dollars in 1938 because it opened nationwide in 30 in February of 38. And if that doesn't sound impressive, keep in mind we're in the middle of the Great Depression at the time. Yeah, it was for there was a there was a short amount of time where it was the highest-grossing sound movie of all time. 
Oh, wow. I, that I did not know. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 I mean, the movie, like, it, nobody expect like nobody expected it to be that big. Obviously, they were already calling it, you know, uh, Walt's Folly and all that stuff. So everyone sort of expected it to just sort of be a thing, and then that was it. Like, if if you may never see a Mickey Mouse cartoon again, you know, kind of situation. But we got what we needed out of him. But. Uh, and, okay, so I actually have the figures. Uh, it's box office totals as of today. Yeah. It's made $418 million. Yeah, it's been... That's box office. We're not talking about DVD, you know, anything else. Anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, that's just theatrical, including re-releases and what have you. Yep. Um, so <laughs> there, there was a... Uh, from what I've heard, there were... 50 potential like dwarf names. <laughs> oh god. And yeah. I'm sure some of those are just the worst. Oh yeah. Well here's 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 a small list that I got out of uh, a book. Um Jumpy. Okay. Stuffy. I can see stuffy. <laughs> uh Burpy. That's a <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, Nifty is actually kind of a, a good Deffy. Deffy is yeah. Deffy. Yeah. So I guess he would go with Dopey a little bit. Dopey doesn't talk, and Deffy can't hear. So he, um, th this one, I don't. Puffy, I don't. I don't like Puffy. That's not a good name. No. But Hickey, Hickey. I, what? Yeah, I don't know what Hickey. Is it like? I don't know what. The slang was in the 30s. Do they mean like a like a hillbilly like character? That would be my guess. That would be my guess. Or, or is he like just he just like gave himself red marks with a vacuum cleaner? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like, yeah, it's 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 a weird it's a weird uh, grouping of names. And I I've never seen the full list of 50, but I would absolutely love to see like. Because you know there's got to be some like just stupid names and there's like Dave or something. Roger. Yeah. But because uh, Doc, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, well, part of what I was, you know, that you mentioned that I kind of wonder like, I wonder there are some names in there that were kind of funny at the time, but now you'd be like, oh, that's racist or that's yeah. culturally insensitive. Yeah. You know full well there is probably some, yeah, some definite. Um, maybe, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of like Song of the South kind of stuff, or oh god, or or you know, like the crows singing their songs or what have you, like just yeah, or or not even like not even like uh, skin color, just be like oh hey, let's make fun of the Irish or whatever. Yeah, yeah, like you, you you fill in the gaps yourself. This is this is a G-rated podcast, so we're not gonna <laughs> Yeah, we're not gonna get into it, but it You can I could imagine things weren't always cool back then. Yeah. If you, there's there's a wealth of letters and stuff that you can read, you know, involving Disney stuff at the time frame, and it's just like, oh yeah, that's right, the thirties, it was okay to call people that. <laughs> Like yeah, quote end quote okay. It's not okay, but yeah. you know. No, it's, it's never been okay, but yeah. Um, apparently, they had settled on Jumpy being one of the dwarfs, but they ended up um, finalizing with Sneezy and Dopey. Um, don't know what the seventh dwarf was that they replaced, but uh, Jumpy, Jumpy. Jumpy was in the uh, was like one of the original dwarves. Walt's idea behind the movie was just all about the dwarves. You can tell by watching the movie, too. <laughs> like, hey, hey, yeah, Snow White is almost secondary in the film. Yeah. Behind the dwarves and the, and the witch. Yeah. Like, like I was saying uh, off the air, um, it's the plot really is only about 20 minutes. I mean, there's like the introduction of Snow White and her getting chased off and ye yelled off, you know, the huntsman scene. And then like the very end where the queen comes in 
and you know as the old hag with the apple and snow white like for, like snow white's death is snow white's death and resurrection is only about another like 15 minutes from like her death to her being brought back up so mm -hmm. the rest of it all of it in the middle is just her interacting with the dwarves for about for the most part <laughs> and it it's just her like uh uh, interjecting herself into the dwarves lives and telling them how to live yeah it's frustrating, it's frustrating yeah. to watch yeah it's uh yeah it's real weird to just sort of um watch them like just how just how just she's very sweet but she is just so dim uh, <laughs> um she's, uh... I mean, I, I know we're, we're talking about this movie, and it's, it's the first movie, and it's, it's a great film. It, but it is. I, she's it's. probably one of the weakest Disney princesses. If yeah. You look at it. Yeah. I, 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 I will see one thing particularly about this movie that they did really, really, really well, and that's eyes. Yes. Like, they, like you can just like they're just they're just like bright and like full of like life, like especially on. Snow White in particular, um, they spent a, you can tell they spent a lot of time like on that part of like the face and stuff. Like it was like very important to make her iconic. You can tell. Um, even even the dwarves, even the dwarves' eyes, the scene where the dwarves find her dead, and yeah, crying and yeah, you can. Yeah. It's a the scene where uh, Grumpy finally starts crying is a very very good scene. Like yeah. It's uh, and apparently it really it really hit the mark at screenings of that movie. Like people were people, like adults were like crying uh, in 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 these scenes. And, it was waiting for Grumpy to give them the okay. Yeah, and you know it's a uh, it's an incredibly charming movie all around. Um, yeah. I don't think it like. Okay, so this movie is number 34 on the AFI Top 100 list. Okay, is it the highest Disney animated film or no? It is the only animated film on the AFI 100 Oh, wow. List. There's okay. no other animated films on that list. And it is the number one of the top 10 animation films of all time. And in the top 10 list is all Disney with the exception of Shrek. Um, because yeah, toys like Toy Story's on there too. So you know, there's Pixar on there too. And that's you know, that's Disney. Even uh, though cats don't dance, yeah. Well, you stay in the sun. Yeah, I'm sorry to inform you that uh, none of the uh, uh, n none of the Don Bluth animation <laughs> films have found their way into the top ten. Um, <laughs> but um, but I, I don't. I don't know if it's the best animated movie of all time. I, I, nobody will ever take away that it is absolutely 1000% the most important animated movie. No. It is a technological marvel. Like you watch this movie and it's kind of mind blowing if you try to put yourself in the time frame of 1937, 1934, when the bulk of this movie was being, you know, hashed out and everything, where this wasn't a thing that existed. Cartoons, you know. I've only been around for not, I mean, Mickey Mouse was 1928. Yeah. Um, you know, Oswald stuff was just a couple of years before that. Like Felix the Cat things were, you know, in the 20s, you know. And so, but, you know, cartoons haven't even been around for, you know, in this form for, uh, you know, barely a decade at this point. And we're already going for theatrical film. Um, it's it's mind blowing how you can make a, a studio that's used to making, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten minute movies into an hour and a half <laughs> ordeal, um, and it was it was as brutal as you think it would be. Oh, I imagine. Um, I, they, they had to still maintain the regular schedule of like whatever else they're doing, and then also crank this thing out. Yeah, they said they started. Um, uh, some of the animators um, started doing um, kind of art classes in the production. Oh so, because because you know they 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 weren't really used to what they were doing with this, where it was where realism above all else was important on here. So it was it really was like a um, we're just going to get some of the guys together because at, remember 
most most animators were just cartoonists that had the natural progression into um, animation. The, right. They weren't animators, so you know, animation was a whole new sort of whole new thing for a lot of these people. Um, cause how do you, how do you train to be an animator in the thirties when it's already a new field, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, you, know yeah. you, you don't it, go to, you, you go to school for art. You don't go to school for animation. So when you're doing cartoons for the newspapers or, you know, books and stuff, it, it's like completely different scenario. So the, the, you know, they've, they're, they're hiring models and everything. And eventually Walt gets involved and is like, if you, if you do this stuff, in studio, I will provide what you need. So like classes started becoming a thing at Disney Studios for learning like animation, and, uh, how, to, how to animate real people, you know, bring in real animals to try to, you know, have, you know, how these animals move and look and, you know, bring in people dancing. And so it's like, okay, so this is dancing. You know, it wasn't too, you know, their, their full scenes were acted out so the animators could animate either on it or using it as reference. You know, rotoscoping was a thing. Um, they started using it, they started leaning on it more and more in later films. They tried not to do it. Um, they didn't really want to do it, but again, they were, they were on a, they were on a, con you know, time constraint at, at, towards the end. So there are times where it was like, okay, we have to rotoscope Snow White uh, doing you know, this, this movement or whatever. So um, if, if, if you think about this movie, so there's a handful of movies in history yeah. where we have to invent this technology to do this thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. And this is one of them. You think this and Star Wars and maybe a couple others, but we actually have to create this technology ourselves. Yeah. And um, they use the multi-plane camera while doing this so that's why like the scenes have like a three-dimensional depth layer mm -hmm. to them because they're using a multi-plane camera so um you know you, you can rotate scenes like where when the queen transforms and stuff like they have to really like go all in so the movie um not 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 an easy process for anyone involved period and thank god it paid off for them uh, they, they, and they made it they made they, they had their world premiere at the carthay circle theater december 21st 1937 and then it was released to a, a broader release in february 1938 yep february of 38 yeah no, so and we, and we yeah. said like you know we we're saying like okay well we don't know if this is our favorite disney movie, movie. And that's, yeah. that's a that's, that's objective. objective but imagine yeah. seeing this movie in 1938 Oh God! It, it probably like it, it's it's absolutely it's a movie that even though it's not my favorite Disney movie, like completely sticks with you just on its own merits alone. It's got a wonderful soundtrack. Yep. Um, it, it, it's absolutely gorgeous looking. I mean, there's better looking cartoons, sure, especially especially like when you get to even a even the next two movies look visually more stunning than this particular movie, but like it has a personality all of its own where it just, it can really stick with you. And having that be all brand new territory in 1938 must just be mind blowing. Like, just, I, I, would, I would argue that Snow White looks better than some of the movies that he released in the 60s. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, like, and I don't want to get into which ones those are, but I well, do. we'll get yeah. we but we will get there. We I mentioned the there. soundtrack, so I feel like a couple of things going forward is like some some key points that we can hit on. You know, was there a, like a charting song off the soundtrack because Disney is known for its hit music and stuff, and the '30s is kind of a long ways away, and charting <laughs> isn't really. Um, is it really uh, is it trackable? Uh, you're making a lot of noise over there. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I was, I was, uh, I was, I was scratching my head. Um, <laughs> no white, Benny Goodman. This, uh, top of the chart. But um, but hi ho and whistle while you work 
were like massive hit songs in the in 38. Um, I teased at the beginning of the show that we would, um, that there was a first that I didn't know was a first of this movie in general. And based on everything that I've seen, it seems as if Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is the first commercially available soundtrack. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was reading on, I was reading some stuff and it, it, it was, there was like, it was the first American film to have a soundtrack album. Uh, and, well, and it, it kind of makes sense. I'm like, yeah. trying to think. Of, you know, What's that? I'm trying to think of all these movies that came up before then that should have had soundtracks, but that's weird. Yeah, but like nothing would have really had a soundtrack if you really break it down. Like because at this point in time, sound movies are still brand new. So that's true. the soundtrack would have pro would have been in a lot of cases what was on hand at the theater wasn't necessarily something that was picked for the movie. It just would fit with the movie or, you know, like, and, and the jazz singer or something like it, there would, there was no need for a soundtrack or all that stuff. But like, this is a movie with original songs written for it that obviously they want to get out there and make money off of. And, you know, catchy songs, you know, whistle while you work and hi ho <laughs> or like, you, you know, those are two songs that like you're you're milling around the house doing chores and you start singing like whistle while you work or something, you know, like it is part of just American culture. Even hi ho, you get off of work <laughs> and you, you can't help but think about it once in a while. <laughs> By the way, uh, you uh, you talked about the AFI list earlier. Yeah, uh, there is actually a song from the uh, soundtrack that's on the AFI's. 100 years, 100 greatest songs. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Someday my prince will come. Yeah, I, I, I buy that. That makes, it's probably... The 19th greatest film song of all time, according to AFI. Wow. I, I think that there are, I think the other two songs that we named are probably more iconic songs, but best, I guess, makes uh, a little more, uh, <laughs> a little more sense. I, uh, but, but how many times is this the melody of that song? Yeah. yeah it's, it's pretty synonymous with Disney. Yeah, it, absolutely. Um, like, it, it's, it's, it's in there with that and, like, When You Wish Upon a Star. Right. Or, like, or like the, they're like the Disney theme songs. When You Wish Upon a Star, Someday My Prince Will Come, and, like, the Mickey Mouse Club March. Like, those are, like, their theme songs. Like, you can't help but... Uh, but no, those songs. So, um, so how many times do you think this movie has been re-released in theaters? Um, I know for sure it was <laughs> at least uh, at least twice because again I saw it in nineteen eighty three. So uh, I'm going to take a guess and say, let's just say six. Why not? Okay, its first release was in the middle of World War II in 1944. Okay. Um, Disney's, at that point, it started the tradition of doing a re-release on its uh, every 10 years. <laughs> oh, my God. Disney started doing a re-release schedule of, like, every 10 years they'll start doing re-releases and they may not be 10 years on the nose but close enough so you had 44 52 58 inexplicably <laughs> like just a few years later 67 75 83 87 and 93 and has been so, out theater since 93 so 93 and 93 um <laughs> has a distinction because it um, it was the first film to be entirely scanned in the digital format. Huh. Yeah. So let me let me ask you a question. What was what was the first you saw it in ninety three, I take it? I probably yes, ninety three would have been the first time I had seen because I'm I am yes, definitely saw it in ninety three because I had seen it. Younger than me, just go ahead and say it when I yeah. saw it. Three. Yeah, no, I'm trying to think. Like, I, was there? A there's probably a small chance that I was taken to it in '87, but I was so 
like I was only a few years old at that point that I don't, I wouldn't remember it, but I know 93 because I know I definitely saw it in theaters. Um, the yeah. fifth, it was the 50th anniversary in 87, <laughs> which, oh, well, um, so that was a big deal. Um, then was it the first one to have that VHS clamshell packaging? No, um, the, the, the VHS, the story behind the VHS situation uh, with Disney is absolutely wild because they absolutely did not want to do it. <laughs> like internally, the, the people in charge of those decisions, like Eisner, absolutely didn't want to cut into the theatrical profits of movies when they get re-released in theaters and they thought it was going to absolutely cannibalize that industry. Which it did, but they didn't realize it was a good thing that that happened. Uh, um, that's uh, for such a uh, forward-thinking company. That's kind of a hmm. <laughs> yeah. But you have to remember, at this point, it would have been the early '90s, and that company was not doing well at this point in time. They they're they're starting to. The animation stuff is coming back around, but like the studio, the company itself is hemorrhaging money with bad, with bad uh, executive decisions being made, <laughs> and um, the, so I, I liked Oliver's we, company. <laughs> we will get to, we will get to who the first VHS release of a Disney movie is when we get to that movie, which is very soon. <laughs> Notice I said clam. Uh, yeah, well, I, that's just how movies were sold back then. So, <laughs> you know, unless they're like the, crappy old horror films. Yeah, yeah, but um, Disney stuff was always in that cool pla white plastic. You know, they redesigned them a few times with like labels and stuff, but it was always that cool white plastic clamshell because movies were incredibly expensive to buy. <laughs> Do you remember when they uh, released the Half Mill toys and they had the clamshell package and the toys came in? Oh, absolutely. I, I absolutely have owned some. Do you think I don't own some of those? I know you do. <laughs> sorry to get out. Sorry to get out of uh, topic here. But, yeah. but uh, um, the, uh, the first time it was released on home video, this particular movie was 1994. God. Yeah. And it was released simultaneously on VHS and Laserdisc, obviously. I because that's what probably, yeah. I bet. I imagine if you were fortunate to have a Laserdisc player back then, it probably looked amazing. I, I'm a, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm really certain that that was a phenomenal way to watch it. And it's only an hour and a half, so you know it's not like you're. It's not like you know you're watching it or something where it's like four discs and you have to flip them around every half an hour. So. Why did I? Why did I buy two laser discs? <laughs> but um, uh, it, within its first year on the market, it had sold twenty four million tapes on um, this particular movie. I believe it. Yeah. No, it's you know it is one of the more. Tr it's obviously the most treasured. Um, Disney movie, and you're gonna get some. You're gonna get some, You're gonna get some real interesting insight into how the Disney company was looking based on video sales when we go forward and stuff. And like how they paced them out, and like what came first. Like why was this one chosen? Movies that. Spoiler alert: A lot of the movies after this don't make any money. <laughs> um, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. Um, but so I guess the next question to ask about this movie in terms of its cultural impact is, was, is there theme park attractions at Disney theme parks? Um, I know the dwarves are, I forget what ride it is. So uh, it was absolutely an opening day attraction at Disneyland. They have Snow White's Scary Adventures. Oh, okay. Did not know that. Yeah, and um, it's also um, that that same ride is at Tokyo and Paris, and the Magic Kingdom. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they got rid of the ride; it's no longer at the Magic Kingdom. So, but but it's been 
That would explain why I don't know that. <laughs> but there is a new Snow White ride at the Magic Kingdom that opened in 2013 called the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, which is a sort of a high-speed roller coaster through the through the uh, Diamond Mine. You know what? You're right. I did see that. I was at Disneyland back in April, but I, my children would not have stood for that. But yeah, you're right. <laughs> but um, and and they have the um, they have the well there next to the mm -hmm. castle and they have if um, there's a funny story if you look at if you're at the theme parks there's uh the well and off in off to the side there are some small uh statues that was given to them as gifts but um all of the statues are the same size so snow white is the same size as the seven dwarfs <laughs> and they didn't know what to do with them so they did what Disney does best and use forced uh, perspective. So you put Snow White on top and the dwarves down low. So they're the same size, but it makes Snow White look a little bigger because she's on top of everything, on t above all, towering above all the dwarves and everything. So um, if, you, if you ever find yourself at the Disneyland, you find those statues and realize that they're all exact, exactly the same size. And it's, inc it's, it's adorable. <laughs> Now, now, I remember reading while we were while we were doing prep for this, uh, maybe it was a few days ago. The original plan for the castle at Disneyland was to be Snow White's castle, right? Uh, there was like obviously because there was a castle in uh, Snow White. It was obviously like first draft. Like we have, like yeah, we're gonna have a castle. It has to be like this is a castle, an iconic castle. So uh, initial plans would have been that castle but it didn't take once production got underway and they started building stuff it quickly became obvious that um with sleeping beauty coming out just around the corner that that being the castle just sort of made sense as sort of a teaser for an upcoming movie which is sort of a funny it, 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 like you're you're forever trapped with your decision of a teaser trailer essentially <laughs> You know what? We're going to put some money in this black cauldron idea. We're going to up a section of the park. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, you know, some things are just... It's, it's, it's funny to see what gets the theme park treatment and what doesn't from Disneyland. And when they make the bet wrong decision, how they're just stuck with it <laughs> for a while. And you, like, and you think about it, it's no way it's actually woefully underrepresented, even though they have the one ride there. Yeah, they have. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a you know opening day attraction, but there's, there's not a whole lot of because you know the next, the next step in our was there, was there a video game? Obviously, this is the '30s, so no, there wasn't a video game when it came out. But was there eventually a video game? Uh, <laughs> and, according to you, Game Boy, right? According, yes, there was in 2001. They made a Game Boy Color game. Um, and there was supposed to be an Atari version of the game, but it never came out because that's that's just how that stuff worked then. So. Probably, Snow White is probably a playable character in a, in, a, in Mugen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, there was um, uh, there, there's there's Kingdom Hearts obviously exists, right, right. and you know, obviously Snow White has some representation in that. Um, and she's, and she's showing up in uh, Wreck-It Ralph too, as well. Yep. And um, so that leads us to another thing. Uh, uh, people always like to tease because there was a stretch where Disney sort of sequeled everything. Is there a sequel to Snow White and Seven Dwarfs? I believe there is. There's not. In the okay. traditional <laughs> sense. There is some interesting sort of like spin-offs in a sense but not like not like there's like no direct to video sequels or anything there was um there was going to be a prequel at one point huh. um that disney was working on no. um, and, it, and it was going to be it was like this is how the dwarves met and how the evil queen became the queen you know because obviously she killed snow white's dad <laughs> like 
like she's at the beginning of this at the beginning of Snow White, she's living in the castle and the queen's there. And <laughs> there is no king around. Uh, so that's one of those cases where it's like, don't tell me how the ice cream's made, just give me the ice cream. Yeah, yeah. And so that was gonna be um uh that was gonna be the story and then and then at one point it was going to be centered completely around Dopey and why he can't talk. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Yeah. And it was going to be like a real Tommy situation where he saw his mother getting like dying or something. <laughs> like it was, it, it's, but played it, a meat pinball. Yeah. Just like the super like, what? Okay. But then Disney bought um, Pixar. <laughs> And that brought Lassiter in, and Lassiter just like immediately canceled it. So <laughs> that was probably fun. Yeah, um, there is uh, so there. So yeah, you don't really have um, you, you don't have your traditional like sequel stuff. There was that um, there's that rose red that Disney keeps talking about that they want to spin the character off of the character of Rose Red and obviously everything's getting a um, remake, a live action remake these days, so that's on the docket. I, I want to say the Queen my, my wife used to watch once upon a time. I think the Queen was in that show. Yes, she absolutely. They've absolutely had them in uh, pretty much anything that has like crossover appeal the characters have appeared in at some point so you know house of mouse once upon a time sophia the first they're all um they they show up there was apparently and i despite knowing so much about disney had zero idea they made a seven dwarves cartoon a few years ago <laughs> it was on the disney channel or xd or disney xd D? yeah okay. two seasons in 2014 Huh. And it was a TV series about the Seven Dwarves. They look nothing like their cartoon version. Oh God! Was like, it like was it like Quack Pack where they had like rad nineties dude? Yeah, yeah, but in two thousand and fourteen, yeah. <laughs> like backwards hat and skater shorts. Yeah, yeah. No, I was read when I was reading this stuff. I was like, wow, that's something that I absolutely had zero idea about. Um, uh, there was a very short-lived Broadway musical. Um, You're right. I, I, I did, I did for reading that. Uh, yeah, lasted about a lasted like about a couple of months on two separate years, something. So there I mean, was also the slew of uh, different animation studios doing their own version of Snow White. Oh yeah, the, you, we could do a whole we could do a whole spinoff episode of just like the bootleg dollar versions that you get like in the big lots in the bin <laughs> like you know like so kind of going back to the video games thing. fun fact um there's a snow white game on the super nintendo yeah based, based on the filmation version of snow white yeah exactly what yeah. so i mean it's in terms of i think you've got I, th I think we've covered a lot of ground with this first episode of snow white um we didn't get the plot, but, but, but I honestly, don't. If the you, plot is sort of secondary to the whole idea of this podcast, really, honestly, because and, it, it's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and I think it's you know the plot. Yeah, the the plot is simple. Uh, she runs. She runs away because she's going to get killed. She lives with seven weird men in the forest for about uh, forty five minutes, and then she dies, and then they do a ton, then. Suddenly, the creepy old men keep her in a glass coffin. <laughs> oh God! And Maybe we, we should not talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we could talk. If, oh boy, if you want to talk about anything, like we're not going to dive into the grim fairy tale version of these things because that just makes these everything that there's that's covered ground everyone and their brother like you type that into like youtube and you can get a dozen like how are they different videos of like how is snow white different than the fairy tale how is pinocchio different from the house 
Hey, hey close that. Don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, like some of these fairy tales are very much a sign of their time. And they're, 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 they're <laughs> grim fairy tales kind of live up to that name <laughs> in a lot of instances because, you know, S Snow White is not a happy story. <laughs> no. No. And so, like, I, 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 with Disney, I just want to have, I want to keep things as happy as possible because in a few years, things start getting real sad for this company. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's probably better they didn't make it a murder film. Yeah, and, and, and Disney, you know, people like to make fun of it, but, you know, they they want to make a story filled with hope and it's probably the best way to do it uh, is to just use the story that you're adapting um, as groundwork and build upon it into the, your Disney version. And, you know, does it ruin some old, some old stories from yesteryear? Yeah. You know, it's, you absolutely destroy what the story of Snow White was and it be replaces in everyone's memories. Um, you know, nobody knows the real story of Snow White because since 1938, this has been the version of Snow White period. And I think, in, you know, for the better in some instances, maybe not in other instances, but, you know, here but we are. Is, but at the same time, this movie has dark moments. Yeah, and most Disney movies do. And, and, and Walt goes out of his way to make, sh make sure that his movies contained that sort of like, you know, to, to, they won't, you know, kids should be scared sometimes. And, you know, you can't just completely cut, you know, Disney gets a lot of flack because they try to um, uh, Disney, -fy things. Disney fy things and sugarcoat um, so, some of their, some of their stories of yes, you know, or, or some of the, uh, or even sugar fy just the Walt himself. Um, Which but, we won't get into here, but. Uh, yeah, but, you know. Do your own research, folks. <laughs> yeah, but. They, they they never try to not feature death. Like death plays a major role in almost every story. You know you're gonna get or just terror in general, uh, <laughs> because that that's part of the growing up process. Everything involves somebody growing up for the most part. Right. <laughs> Especially in the Walt era of movies. If you go back and look at a lot of stuff, a lot of it is about growing up and becoming an adult. Snow White, um, Bambi, Pinocchio. Pinocchio, uh, just a lot. Uh, and it's just, and, but there's, you know, the next movie that we're going to tackle, the second Disney movie um, under the animation uh, banner will be Pinocchio. And Pinocchio's real creepy. Like <laughs> The version they put out is real creepy. Yeah, and, and the, the actual Disney movie Pinocchio has some genuinely terrifying scenes in it. Like Pleasure Island is a creepy ass scene. <laughs> that, that, that wear donkey transformation. Yeah. You know, you know, and you know, there's, there's, there's the threat of death and everything. And there's very few movies that don't have, you know, a source of sadness or fear, you know, um, we'll get to yeah, like, it, and when they do, it, it's, blatantly obvious because there some of these are movies that don't necessarily hold up as strongly because they just sort of were empty calorie movies um i don't but, know i think i think pretty much every Disney movie has its own merits i mean yeah you know, I, I think you're gonna get to some some movies world war ii era stuff gets real dicey um and but you know, we'll get there when we get there yeah but i think the uh the last thing i think we're going to touch on is that uh, we're going to be ranking these when we're all done i know i'm <laughs> i'm diving this onto you but uh, obviously based on this being the first episode <laughs> we're not starting the ranking now because it's, it's number it's, one um <laughs> Snow White is above Capcom Fighters Remix. <laughs> yes, Snow White. I knew where you're, I knew where you're going, so it's yeah, okay. uh, it's so you know it's 
that we're, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll be ranking these as we go along the way. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see because I'm certain there's some movies that you haven't seen in a while. I know there's several that I haven't seen in a while. And um, we each have our own personal preferences, too. We all have our own personal preferences. There's eras that we all love. Um, Congratulations to Snow White. The best Disney yeah. movie of all time. Yes. So the number one Disney movie of all time as of today is Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, next week, you will be going head-to-head against uh, the 1940 release classic Pinocchio um, based on an Italian novel of the adventures of Pinocchio. Uh, 1883 is when that book came out. So, yeah. Uh, well, and you know, Snow White, uh, 1812 would have been its release date when the but, original. Yeah. It, it, makes, it makes sense when you look, look at the way, you know, the way the characters are dressed and act. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they don't try to do too go out of their way too much to like modernize uh, no. these characters when they're making them. They, they try to adapt them to how they were in the story, especially during this time frame, as best as they could. Um, so yeah, now in the, uh, in the middle of Pinocchio, he just turns the camera like that. Mussolini's a real pill. <laughs> yeah, they 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 constantly made sure to. Uh, not date their own movies. You, you'll notice when you watch these things up until the nineties, there's never any like pop culture references or anything like, I was like Oliver, Oliver and company be the first one, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, like Oliver and company and like Oliver and company, like Aladdin, <laughs> like the two biggest offenders kind of thing. Like, but I would say, I would say the group that, the, when they when they don't purposely date their films, that's why most of these are so evergreen, and you can go back yeah. and watch it. And it's not like it's like, oh, I don't know what. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's going to do us for this episode. Uh, I'm, I I hope you've at least learned something. Uh, I did. All of this, I, I it's I, every movie has at least some interesting part of history that may be lost through time that you've never heard of before that you've never thought of before and um, or just sometimes they just have interesting stories to tell behind the scenes alone and that's my hopes and goals behind this is to sort of spread that information because it's interesting and it's interesting to me and I think it's fun to listen to somebody who's passionate about something you know it's uh, and it, it's it's fun for me because I think I'm uh, I'm in the position of a lot of our listeners because you're the Disney expert and I'm I know some stuff. Yeah, but I get to learn with everybody yeah. else. Get to learn and and grow. <laughs> I don't know, and, not, not necessarily for the better. I'm not saying you're gonna, you know, but I get to learn and grow. Yeah, it's Schoolhouse Rock, but for Disney movies. <laughs> Um, so Nick, I'd like to thank you for joining me this tonight. My pleasure. Or if you're listening to this. I don't know what time it is. You're listening to this. It could be any time. Thank you for joining me when you joined me, though. And um, tune in next week. We'll be uh, back again with uh, Pinocchio. Thank you, and have a magical day.